Dear all, Me Direct thanks you for joining this webinar, the fifth in our Me Direct talk series, where we aim to introduce you to financial experts and asset managers so that they can share their views on the financial markets and investment opportunities. This webinar is aimed at providing you with information on the current stock market in view of the current pandemic and also the recent US election. MeDirect has always been at the forefront of providing you with the latest on the investment world, and we aim to continue doing so through our regular updates on our website and social media. Our team of experienced wealth advisors are always available to assist you. Stephen Yu, a world-renowned fund manager, has just under 20 years of investment experience and co-founded Blue Whale Capital with Peter Hargreaves. The Blue Whale Growth Fund is a global equity fund focusing on large cap stocks in developed market. The fund was launched in September 2017 with the Irish Domicide Mirror Strategy launching in September 2020. I will leave you now in the good hands of our guest speaker. Stephen will be discussing the stock market with a particular focus on technology stocks. He will also be giving us some information on the approach he and his team take on stock valuation. Following the presentation, we will be having a Q&A session that will be moderated by Edward. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you who submitted your questions via email. Throughout the session, please feel free to send us any additional questions you might have through the Q&A function. Stephen, over to you. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, before I kick off, I thought I would just give uh, maybe our audience about two minutes introduction to what we do at Blue Whale, uh, the investment process. Then I would then go through a couple of points about the COVID. Uh, I will use a few stock examples. I will also talk about technology companies in general. And at the end, I would finish off with uh, valuation on how we go about finding attractive opportunities. So in terms of op investment philosophy at Blue Well is very straightforward. We invest into high quality businesses and an attractive price. And within the team that there are five of us uh, sitting in London to cover about 100 companies. I'm happy to expand on what sort of companies that we cover later on if there, there, there's time to do that. And we, we do all the research in-house and we would try to translate our understanding of those businesses into a financial model for every single holdings that we have in the fund. And by the end of the process, we would then invest into the best of the 25 to 35 companies. And, and then we are very conscious on valuation. We always look for new ideas and the portfolio would continue to evolve over time. So this is what we're trying to do. If we look at the next slide, I just want to show you uh, how we have done since we started three years ago. So please note that the performance numbers that I will be uh, quoting today would be related to the UK domicile fund, which we launched three years ago. And, the, and then we recently we have also launched a Irish domicile fund in September 2020. So since we started, what you can see on this chart is the trailing 12 month performance and let's assume that you have invested in the fund three years ago in September 2017. Then on the left hand side, um, uh, you would, the, the first bar, the blue bar is what you would get uh, having invested in the fund versus the I global sector. And the I global sector is a collection of about 300 global funds. And if at the same time, you can also use the MSCI World Index as a proxy and the return is very much similar to the iGlobal numbers. So I think what you can see on this chart here is we have managed to deliver quite consistent outperformance on an every 12 month period since we started. And obviously over the last three years, we have gone through many mini cycles in terms of the Fed raising interest rates back in Q4 2018 to a very strong bull market in 2019. And this year we had the COVID crisis as well. The other thing that you will notice on this chart is the outcome of the returns that we have delivered. 
that we have managed to deliver over 17% per annum net of all fees versus about 7% for the IA Global. So this fund is really focused on generating significant and consistent outperformance. And that's what we set out to do three years ago. If we look at the next slide, so now let me take you through what's, what's been going on with the fund and the market this year in terms of the COVID impact. So on a very high level that what you can see on this slide is what the fund had achieved uh, in the first half of 2020, that the fund was up about 15% and the market was up about 1%. But it was more, it would be more interesting if you break the first half of the year into two quarters. So the first quarter, when the COVID crisis started, there's a, there was a big sell off in February and March. And then in Q2 this year, that the market recovered quite strongly. So what you can see on the slide here is in the first quarter of the year that the fund was down about 8% and the market was down about 15%. So we lost less money than the market. But when the recovery came in the second quarter this year, that the market recovered about 20% uh, in that quarter, and the fund was up about 25%. So we have managed to deliver outperformance both in the, in the quarter that the market was in negative territory, and also when the market was in a positive territory in the second quarter. So what what actually happened throughout the first half of this year. There are a couple of things that we have done, uh, which I'm going to take you through some live uh, stock examples, but on a really high level that we do have a very strict discipline on valuation. And throughout 2019, we were very cautious on valuation in general, including some of the holdings that we have. Hence, we were holding above 10% cash on the fund level throughout 2019. And it played out quite well when we ran into the COVID crisis in February that we have over 11% cash. And by the end of March, that we have managed to redeploy all the cash that we have in the fund. And it, we invested those cash into existing holdings, the same holdings that we had in the fund before, but at a more attractive valuation. So hence the cash balance ended at about 3% by the end of March. And we were quite busy over that six weeks period just to redeploy those cash at a very attractive price. And hence, I think that explained, uh, that would be a good explanation why we have managed to do well, both in the first quarter of this year and also second quarter of this year. So let me now give you some examples on what companies that we have taken action on and what we have done in terms of the cash. If we look at the next slide, just to give you a bit of a taste in terms of what COVID means for a lot of companies. Obviously, I think as, um, I mean, as the human population, this is a pandemic that a lot of people have suffered, a lot of people have impacted. But I think the perspective that I'm trying to probably bring in the conversation today would be more from a company perspective on how much uh, businesses have been impacted or disrupted by COVID. The first company I want to talk about is Intercontinental Hotels. We did like the company. We invested in this company in 2019. It's a franchise hotel business. So it's a bit like your Domino Pizza that uh, they are, you have a lot of franchisee coming to the group to say, I want to set, I want to run a hotel. I want to build a hotel and what intercontinental hotels group does is they would let you to have their brand so that you can then use that brand to operate a hotel and they would end up getting some sort of royalty from those franchisee and 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 because it's a franchise business it means that intercontinental hotel doesn't need to put up the capital to build the hotel the franchisee would be putting up the capital so in terms of the business model is actually quite a nice business. However, through during the COVID uh, era, I mean, the, I mean, when COVID happened, that the business model in itself has been really challenged by COVID. And there are two things that the business got challenged on. The first, the first one is obviously is us being consumers, having our holidays, travel, leisure, 
different usage of hotels, and that has got stopped because of lockdown. But secondly, the reason that the hotel business is still suffering, despite the fact, I mean, or maybe they they have suffered more, is that they do get a lot of business uh, with companies holding exhibition conferences and also business travel, and obviously that has put into stop. And I was obviously uh, about two years ago or eighteen months ago, I. Uh, me and Ed, I mean, we make a trip to Malta, and we were originally planning to do another trip this year, but that was not possible this time. So, hence, we are doing this live conference now. So that that have obviously have a big, quite a big impact on the hotel. So what you can see on the chart uh, on this slide is that that revenue growth per room has dropped dramatically, and it would take a long time before this would recover. So what we did in February and March was that we sold out of these holdings completely because we dislike macro uncertainties. What we don't do at Blue Well is we don't try to take a view on how the macro is going to play out. So in this particular case would be when do we get a vaccine? When does everything get back to normal? That is. That, that is the macro uncertainty that is very difficult to get a good grip on. We would rather to reinvest the capital away from that, that we have taken from intercontinental hotels into companies that we have more certainties of. So likely that they could actually benefit on the back of the COVID crisis. So which brings me to the next company on the next slide, PayPal. So PayPal has been a top 10 holdings in the fund since we started for quite a good period of time. And, but sometime in 2019, the valuation of PayPal has become less attractive. Hence, we had a much smaller position in PayPal just before the COVID crisis started. And you probably don't need me to explain what PayPal does. It's a wallet, is doing, it's, it's a strong, uh, market leader in outside of the Amazon ecosystem. So if you want to shop online e-commerce, it's likely that you would have a PayPal wallet uh, to complete the transaction. And obviously throughout the pandemic, that there's a lot more new additions in terms of new users signing up to PayPal and also making even more transactions compared to before. So in the past, you could be making uh, maybe one transaction per week or every two weeks. But with the lockdown in in the economy, then it's likely that you will be making even more transactions. So maybe two, three transactions per week rather than one transaction. And PayPal would be making a lot more money on the back of a high usage of their service. So we have sold out of a company that, which is Intercontinental Hotels, that got impacted by COVID. I think the impact is still long lasting. And we deploy those capital into a company that we would think that is likely to benefit significantly on the back of COVID. So what you have seen on the chart is how many users they managed to add to their database. And just at the beginning of the year, they were only at about 300, less, just short of about 300 million users. And now it's approaching 400 million users just within uh, a good 12 month period. So this is something that we like a lot. And this is what happened to companies that if you speak to PayPal, Microsoft, and some other companies, they are quite well positioned in terms of digital transformation, then they would probably tell you that they have seen a accelerated adoption of their services throughout the pandemic era. So I think that is very important. And we try to reflect that onto the portfolio level that we, we would prefer uh, the certainties of company meeting, I mean, delivering the earnings growth trajectory compared to companies that's unlikely to de deliver the earnings growth trajectory. So let me bring you to the next slide that I'm going to talk about uh, technology in general and also how we look at technology. And I prepared two companies on this. So the first one is a company that we really like and it has been a top 10 holding in the fund since we started three years ago. And we still like the company a lot. And the company is Adobe. You would be 
familiar with some of the software that Adobe produce, which is the video editing app, or maybe it's the Photoshop that you use to edit photos. So what has happened over the last five to 10 years, in particular the last five years, is there has been a massive explosion of content creation. So as consumers like us, with the penetration of smartphone in the developed market, that we are consuming more and more content through YouTube, through different websites, and to, through different channel, other channels outside of uh, your mobile phone as well. And it's very typical, it's very likely that those contents would be created through some sort of software produced by Adobe. So Adobe is the market leader in terms of in the creative software space for creative professionals. So this is something that we like. And I think what you can see as well is there's been an explosion of adoption in digital advertising. So typically in the past, let's say maybe 10 years ago, I think a lot of advertisers would still be spending their money advertising on print, newspaper, in magazines, in other billboards, et cetera. But as, as the consumers like us spend more time online, then it makes sense that advertisers would spend their money advertising online. And Adobe is at the forefront of capturing some of these opportunities. So the next technology company that I want to talk to you about on next slide is Autodesk. So the in, you might not be familiar with Autodesk because the end customers would be the architect, construction, manufacturing industry. But Autodesk is the market leader in terms of providing the software, which is the AutoCAD software for architect to design the buildings. And there has been a lot of digitization going on within the construction space. So you might probably have noticed that in the past that on the building site, there's a lot of building manager would be holding out quite a big piece of paper with the drawings, deciding what to do uh, with, the, with the site, what is going into the buildings, et cetera. Obviously that is very inefficient because you need to have a lot of documentation in paper format to go behind the scene after the buildings is completed, completed. But now a lot of this process has been digitized. It means that you will probably see people walking around with their iPad on the building site and they would know exactly what sort of parts has been gone into the buildings. So in the near future, if there's some sort of repair and maintenance on the buildings, then they know where to source those parts. Unlike buildings that have been built, let's say 20, 30 years ago, that you might not know where to find the parts for those, um, for those buildings. So Autodesk is a company that we do like. It's very similar to Adobe in a way that is also a technology company, but the and market exposure is very different. So this brings me to the next slide, which is to give you a taste of how we actually think about technology. Because on the high level, that both of these companies are software companies. If you're looking at the GICS definition, they are grouped under information technology. The business model is exactly the same, which means that they sell you a piece of software. You continue to pay them a subscription fee. So let's say for Adobe it would be about $20 a month. For Autodesk it would be more expensive it's because it's, been, it's used by professionals. But then from a company perspective, they will continue to receive a recurring revenue stream. And at the same time, because produce selling you a piece of software, compared to selling this piece of software to another 100 customers, it doesn't increase their cost base. Hence, they do make very high margin, and they are, it's the same for both companies. And at the same time, if you look at the balance sheet of these two companies, because it's not capital intensive, they don't have to spend anything on capital equipment, etc. then they are, both, of, both of these companies are running net cash on their balance sheet. But as I explained earlier, that underlying these two companies, that the industries, the product capabilities are completely different because for Adobe, the end customers would be the creative professionals. So if you talk about 
uh, advertising agency, people who are creating content, uh, etc., then you would be the typical user for, of Adobe. But for Autodesk, it's completely the opposite. They, they are selling to architects, to the construction and manufacturing sector. If you want to improve or streamline your process in terms of making a product better for consumer or building, uh, I mean, or constructing a building better, then it's likely that you will be a customer of Autodesk. So if you go through the underlying sectors, who are the competitors, like who operate in those space, will be quite quite diverse mix of other companies, which we will deem as quite low quality. At Bluewell, we would not like to get involved in low quality businesses. So for example, in Autodesk space, you could easily invest into a house builders, which is very capital intensive. You can invest into a construction company, which is very low margin, or you can invest into some sort of uh, industrial companies, which might make some sort of spare parts, but but it, it, it is part of a supply chain that you might get squeezed in terms of pricing from, the, from your end customers. So from, at, so from where we sit here, we would prefer to invest in companies such as Autodesk that would give us a similar exposure to the industrial manufacturing construction sectors without getting directly involved. So to us, we, while they look to I mean, look similar being a technology company, but they are actually not the same. If we move, move on to the next slide, I'm just going to spend some time talking about valuation. Obviously, the first part of the exercise is to find high quality businesses. But at the same time, if, you, if the objective is to deliver significant outperformance consistently over the medium term, then valuation is very important. What I've got on this slide is uh, just to show you that the market is much smarter than, than, than it seems. And throughout my career over the last 20 years, that how a fund manager can add value in terms of the methods, in terms of what they do has also evolved. There's a lot of things that used to work when I started my career 20 years ago, no longer work so well because the market is being more efficient. You have more people doing this, I mean, doing the same thing as you do. And it's, it will be very difficult to do better than your competitors if everyone is doing the same thing. So the way that you can think about valuation, whether the price is attractive, is whether you can be ahead of the market expectations. And how do you get ahead of the market expectations? That is very much down to the things that you can do differently to your competitors. If we can look at the next slide, this is what we try to do at do well in terms of our approach. So firstly, all the research that we do is in-house. We don't speak to any sell side external analysts. We don't read any broker's research because we feel that those resources are readily available to our competitors. And because there are five of us in the team, we can spend a lot of time doing fundamental research. And we do feel that doing your own research, it, it means at least it would imply that the conclusion that we get to would be very much in line with the investment philosophy that we have. Secondly, for every single company that we have in the fund, we would build a financial model to translate our understanding of the business. So for every single holding in the fund, we have a, a specific model that is catered for that company or to cater for that industry. And what we try to do after we spend time on research, on valuation, is we would try to make forecasts on how much money this company is going to make over the next three to five years. And this is how we can then determine whether the price of this company is attractive or not. And there will be times that we could have invested in the company, let's say today, that the price is very attractive. But maybe two years from today, that the price is no longer attractive and that would get reflected in our financial model so that we can act accordingly. 
if I bring you to the next slide, which is basically to summarize in terms of the some of the companies, some of the factors that we look at in terms of how we did, uh, how we determine whether a business is high quality or not, and also some other sectors that we also consider as attractive outside of technology. So in terms of how we determine a high quality business, we like companies that are uh, that have a very strong market share, pricing power, high switching costs in terms of the product lock-in, good management team, and their business model is not at risk of being disrupted by external factors. And the company could then deliver a high return on invested capital on a sustainable basis. So this is what we like about our company. And these uh, framework apply to both technology company and also non-technology companies. So I already talked about Adobe and Autodesk. They go through the same process as how we define a high quality business. And at the same time, we will also use the same framework to look at non-technology companies such as Visa and Stryker, a medical equipment companies. Both of these companies are also in our top 10 holdings. So this is what we do with this framework. And if you are interested, I'm happy to talk about technology companies that we don't feel that are high quality later on in the Q&A. And there's a lot of things that we don't like uh, with the, even within the technology sectors and we are highly selective in terms of what we like and don't like. The next slide, I will probably just maybe give you a bit of a taste on ESG, uh, which is quite a hot topic in the market. And one thing that we don't do uh, for this fund is this is not a high impact fund. So we are not actively seeking for companies that would deliver good to the societies, means that they would be probably be embracing some sort of green energy. Uh, they are probably doing good to the social, ad, I mean, to the social side of the community, etc. This is not what we do as part of our investment process. But the ESG is very much embedded as part of our selection criteria to filter out companies that, that are low quality or they're not doing good to the societies. So for example, under env en environmental, that we dislike company that are causing harm to the environment, such as coal mining companies. Because if your, if your product is causing harm to the environment, it means that there's a lot of uh, cost to your business that you probably need to clean up uh, some of the uh, maybe mess that you've made to, to, I mean, to the water, to the, I mean, to the carbon cycle, etc. And there will be a lot of regulators at the same time to go after your business to increase your regulatory costs. So we don't invest into mining companies or in gas companies, etc. The second one will be on the social side that we dislike companies that, was, that sell product that is causing harm to the human population, such as tobacco companies. And I think as we know that, uh, that I, mean, you, I mean, within the sectors that you do, they do get protests from both some activists who, who are against the product at the same time from the regulators. And if you have, I mean, a big part of the society going against your company or your product, then it's very unlikely that you can deliver high return on investor capital over a long-term period. And it's likely that that number would be trending downwards from, from, from here. Last but not least, corporate governance is always a major factor in terms of how we invest into a company. As I mentioned before, that we like to invest in companies with a good corporate governance, good, co good management team, etc. So that is very important. And so if you put all these three factors together, then it means that it's likely that if a company is is a high quality businesses, you would expect them to do the right thing over time. So this is how we look at ESG. If you're interested, uh, we have put up a few more examples online, uh, which you can uh, go to uh, look at later. The last one, uh, which, which the next slide, um, which is just to summarize that I, I mean, I probably don't have time. I think my clock is running that I don't have time to go through every single issues that we, I mean, we, I mean, we deal with, but 
on if you're interested then you can come to our website that i we have written a few articles to talk about how the portfolio have managed to do well or transcend different elections we've just seen a election in the us and the fund continue to trend in the right direction or oh, sorry or maybe you say our companies continue to trend in the right direction irrespective whether trump or biden is to be elected i've we have also written an article on valuation how we go about that in more details and how we think about technology um, in in a more uh, detailed manner so maybe i will just stop here and i'm very happy to take questions Thank you all for joining us. Um, to briefly introduce myself, my name is Edward Malia, and I'm the Relationship Manager at Blue Whale Capital. Um, I'll be moderating the Q&A session this evening, so please do submit your questions via the Q&A function um, in, uh, as part of the app, as part of the Zoom app. Um, I'll start with the, the first question, which, which we, we got in advance. And, and once you spoke a bit about ESG, Stephen, um, one one listener has asked whether the increase in ESG type stocks, whether we feel that will con the increase in demand for ESG um, stocks will, is going to continue over the long term. Um, I, I'll leave that to you to expand on. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, ESG is very much part of our process. So obviously, I think if you're looking at the market, there's a lot more activists fund in terms of pursuing the ESG mandate and you would probably expect that this would become quite in better part of the stock market or how companies are going to get assessed and in Europe that I'm a, you might be aware there's a regulation coming through that for any fund managers or for any companies they have to make certain disclosure in terms of how they deal with ESG in general so what, what is likely to happen is in five to 10 years from today, I don't think anyone would be talking about ESG in itself because it just become part of disclosure. Companies or fund managers would be expected to have an approach to deal with the ESG issues in general. So yeah, I think this is a very much a trend that has been started uh, over, over the many years, but it has been accelerated over the last couple of years. So you can see a more massive adoption in the next five to 10 years. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, just a, a follow-up question on, on some stocks in, in ESG. Um, we mentioned that we don't like um, companies that harm the environment or tobacco, but we have some, some stocks like Diageo and Davide, uh, Davide Campari Milano. Um, would you like to explain why we hold these, these stocks um, and reiterate that we're not a, a, an impact fund per se? Yes, I think, I mean, we do have some beverages company, but as I explained earlier that we, I mean, it really depends on the view that you take. And given that, I mean, if you talk about beverages company, that is more of a consumer choice that I mean, obviously, a lot of these companies are doing the best they, they can. They will make sure that people will be aware of how many drinks that they should take. But it's really much of a, of a choice for consumers. And I think a lot of these companies are doing a lot in terms of how they produce the product, how they make sure that anyone who, who might not, who should not be getting the product would be banned to do so. So we don't, we, we, I mean, from Blue Well that we, we have taken a view that the beverages company are less severe in terms of the risk level compared to tobacco companies. So that, that's the view that we have taken. Thank you, Stephen. We'll move on to something which is um, more about uh, how, how we run the fund and, and, and one of the listeners has asked about how we determine entry points and ex exit strategies um, in, in the stocks you buy. So maybe you can expand on the process a bit. Yes, this is very much to, uh, to do with valuation. So there are a couple of things that we, we do do at Blue Well. So the first, the first one, which is a very clear cut that if any of our holdings 
uh, ended up being disrupted by some external factors, such as the one that I mentioned earlier, a COVID crisis on intercontinental hotels, then we will exit the position quite quickly. So that is just independent of valuation. We dislike macro uncertainties. That's what that's part of the process. But in a more typical setting, that if we are just talking about a company, a, a both, I mean, two companies being equally good or attractive in terms of the business model, but then we would then have to decide which one that we would have a bigger weighting or maybe which one we would have in the fund. Then we are then talking about valuation. So which, which one is trading at a more attractive price. So within the valuation model that we have is that a couple of things that we do. So I already mentioned that for every single company that we have in the fund, that we have a financial model. We will make forecasts in terms of earnings, how much money this company is going to make over the next three to five years. And we will compare our forecast or translate that into a valuation number versus the market expectations. So if our forecast to say, give you an example. So let's say if we forecast this company to make 110 euro three years from today, and the market at the moment is expecting this company to deliver 100 euro three years to today, then it means that we are 10% ahead of the market expectations. So the, the, the share price in itself that is trading today is likely to be undervalued. But then let's say a year from today, so, so we forecast three years, but a year from today, we, we look at the three years number again, that we have not changed our, ex, our expectations, that is still, uh, we still forecast this company to deliver 110 euro. But the market have caught up with our expectations, which means that the market probably become more optimistic about the prospect of this company. And the market is now expecting this company to deliver 120 euros three years from today. So we ended up to be behind the market consensus. And it's likely that the shares is overvalued on that note if our forecast is proved to be correct. So this is one thing that we do constantly and we do update our forecast at, at a minimum once a quarter. And then secondly, in terms of the valuation exercise, we also compare the absolute valuation of our company to the market or to the peer group. So let's say if we are talking about Adobe, Autodesk, Microsoft, they are all software businesses, then the valuation metrics would be compared against each other. If we are looking at, let's say, the medical equipment companies such as Stryker, Boston Scientific, Medtronic, and some other names, then we will be comparing the valuation relative to each other within that sector. And we want to find the best opportunity for any stocks that we, I mean, within any sector that we get involved with. And one thing uh, which is very important to remember that this is a high conviction portfolio. It means that we typically, we only invest into the best of 25 to 35 stocks. And we can't just keep adding new companies because that's a con we are constrained in terms of finding the best ideas. So if we have a better idea and if we decided to add that new ideas into the fund, then it's likely that someone have to give way for these new ideas. And that's very much depending on the valuation of those companies. Thank you, Stephen. Just to let you know that we have around um, 10 questions in queue. Um, th the next question I'll tackle, there's been a couple of questions regarding um, technology stocks um, and realizing that they've done very well um, and they've, they've, the prices have done, have done quite strongly over the past years. And uh, the listener is maybe a bit concerned that maybe it's a bit dangerous to, uh, at this stage in the market, to, to, at this stage in the cycle to, to, to invest in technology stocks. Maybe you can explain our views on, on timing and, and, and how, we're, how we manage this within the fund. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a very good one because I would take this opportunity to expand a little bit more on technology sector in general. So throughout the course of this year, that there's a lot of technology names that have seen a lot of benefit from COVID. But to us, a lot of these companies are, are remain to be low quality businesses, despite the fact that they have done quite well year to date. 
um, they have added a lot of new subscribers, etc. But then it doesn't change the fact that some of these companies' business model in itself is quite low quality. So let me give you two examples to illustrate that. The first one is maybe I shouldn't be using this example because at the moment we're using Zoom, the video app, uh, to do this live call. But we do not uh, think Zoom, the company, is a high quality business. The reason being is Obviously, over the course of the last nine months, a lot of people have signed up or a lot of people have started to use Zoom. But there's a lot of competition in terms of the video conferencing app space. Like we, I mean, within uh, our company, we do use Microsoft Teams a lot. I think some other company, they probably use Google. Some other company could be using or consumer could be using WhatsApp. And the problem is not just adding the number of subscribers or people who are using Zoom to participate in some sort of conference or, or, uh, or call is how you get people to pay for that to start with. Because if you can't get people to pay for that, it means that you don't have any pricing power. And the, then the way that I would associate Zoom to and other sectors which you might be familiar with, and these are sectors that we would never get involved with, would be the taxi app software companies that we have on our smartphone, such as Uber, Lyft, Boats. There's a lot more that you can think of. And the problem with a lot of these taxi apps on your smartphone is there's no lock-in in terms of switching costs. You can be easily using Uber to get your taxi today, and tomorrow you could be using another one if the offer is better or because the, obviously the, the service level are quite similar. So it's kind of like a commodities. And I think that's very much similar in terms of uh, the business for Zoom. So it's yet to be determined whether they could actually make any money, I mean, on a sustainable basis over the medium term when they start charging for their service. Another company that we dislike, which have done quite well this year as well, is Netflix. So everyone will be familiar with Netflix. I mean, I myself, I'm, I do ne like Netflix a lot as a consumer, but we dislike Netflix as a investment. The reason being for Netflix is there's no question for them to add new subscribers. There's no issue for them to produce good content continuously. I mean, we, uh, we have now just seen the release of The Crown, and that's a good hit. And obviously, you, if you look at the production, they have spent a lot of money in producing that, uh, I mean, to, to make it into such a high quality drama series. The problem for Netflix is how do they start making good return on investment? And you have a lot, and within the space, there are a lot of strong competitors. So Netflix would be competing for contents versus Disney Plus, YouTube, Amazon Prime, HBO's, Hulu. There's so many others that's out there competing for the same contents that they are paying a higher price for, for, for the producers, for actors, etc. And that would never end because unless Netflix one day become the only uh, kind of home entertainment uh, hub that we get, you will always have competition for content. And the similarity I would draw on that would be very similar to your football club. So like in the UK, we have Manchester United, you have Juventus in Europe, etc. The problem with all these club is for consumer like us, I mean, we like to watch their games, but for the club owner, they would continue need to pay top dollars for the best players. And it's so inflationary that you would never expect the price for a top player would come down at all. It just continued to go up. So this is what happened with Netflix that they, they could continue to sign up for new subscribers, but then they need to deliver high return on investor capital, which is very difficult to do so when you have such a strong competitive landscape. So for all these companies, I would be quite worried because once the tailwind from the COVID, so everyone is now signed up to Netflix, then the reality could come back into play. But for companies that we have in the fund, which when I, which the two companies that I talk about would be Adobe and Autodesk, we do, firstly, we feel that the valuation remain quite attractive. Secondly, that there's no competitor in their space. You will still be using Adobe 
five, I mean, you will be using Adobe five years ago, you will still be using Adobe five years later from today because there's no competitors. They are very strong in terms of the product offering. At the same time that the acceleration in terms of adoption uh, that we consume more content is actually good for them. And they are seeing an increase or uh, upsurge in demand. And we, we, we feel that this demand is sustainable because they don't encounter the same issues as Zoom or Netflix, for example. So I think that you need to be quite uh, selective in terms of what is within the technology sectors. And obviously that would be other sectors that we haven't talked about that you, they will be going through some sort of hardware cycle. They'll be selling more products now, but then in the near future, when, a, when we started to have a vaccine, maybe we don't need those products anymore. So you can term those sales cycle as one off. So I think you, you need to be quite careful within the technology sector as well. Thank you, Stephen. We've had a question as well about two more stocks which we hold in the fund, which are Amazon and Alphabet. And the listeners asking um, is commenting that they don't feature in our top 10 and, and is, is wondering what the reason for this is. Maybe you can expand on that. Yeah. Um, so firstly, on Amazon, that we is Amazon was also a company that we have increased our position dramatically uh, during the COVID sell-off in March, and it was a top ten holding for a period of time early this year. So around Q2, at the beginning of Q3. But as I I talk about earlier, that we are very we have a very strict discipline on valuation. And if you look at the share price of Amazon, look at the valuation that has gone up over, I think about 70 to 80% year to date. So we became less um, kind of, we become less eager to have a, such a big holding in Amazon after they have done extremely well. So since Q3 started, that we have been reducing our position in Amazon. And now it, you don't see them, sorry, you don't see Amazon in the top 10 anymore, but it still, it, it remain a small position in the fund. It's a bit similar to what happened in 2019, as I talked about earlier, that we didn't have PayPal or Amazon in the top 10 because of valuation concern. So now they, they are just sitting outside of the top 10. For Google or Alphabet, it's a bit different that if you follow the FANG market, that there's a lot of antitrust um, kind of uh, conversation going. We don't worry about antitrust that much because we feel that if you, you're going to break up Amazon, break up Facebook, I mean, it would worth a lot more to shareholders compared to they put it, I mean, they, I mean, they are put together. But I think for Alphabet or Google, it's a bit more complex, the argument, because their business is quite entrenched into quite a few different areas. You are talking about the search, uh, Google search. You are talking about the Android system. You are talking about the cloud. You are talking about the royalty they pay to Apple to have their search engine being the de facto search engine on the Apple iPhone, etc. So I think there's a lot of going on there. And if you then look at the valuation of Alphabet, it's not very attractive. So basically you put the two together that we do like the company over the long term, but over the shorter term that I think there's a lot more issues that remain to be seen. I mean, we are not overly concerned, but, but and, and hence we, is still, we, we still do have a position in the fund, but it's just much smaller compared to, let's say Facebook at the moment, you, you do see it on our top 10 holding. Thank you, Stephen. Um, there's been a few more questions. There's 13 questions and we have around 10 minutes left. So if we don't manage to get through all of them, there's a few about fees and all of this. I'll either ask um, um, me direct representatives to get back to you or I'll try and cover them at the end of the session. Um, but the next question we have is about our views on EV and whether this is something which is, uh, is the 2020 explosive growth all hype or is it, do, you see, do we see value in this at, at, at the stock level? Maybe you can give a brief answer on that. Yeah, we don't, uh, we don't do much on the, I mean, on the EV side. And the, I mean, I already talked about that. I mean, that's another way to 
uh, I mean, I mean, to to participate in in some of these opportunities in a market which we will deem as quite low quality. For example, if you are interested in the EV market, you could either be going into the automakers, the OEMs, such as I mean, maybe the Volkswagen, the Toyota. I think they are doing quite quite a bit in EV space. Or you can go into the battery makers. Typically, those companies are quite speculative. They're quite small. Is highly competitive in terms of space. I mean, if you're referring to Tesla being some sort of EV play, I mean, we don't def we don't define Tesla as a high quality company. I mean, we can talk about that later if you wish. And the the auto space is highly competitive. So for us, the exposure that we have to the auto space indirectly would be through Autodesk and Dassault System. So both of these company have. Exposure to the manufacturing space and automakers would be their end customers. So, so the end customers for Dassault or Autodesk would be the likes of Toyota, uh, BMW, uh, Dama, Dama, etc. So, we would prefer to have exposure indirectly to that space, but we don't have anything that's directly, uh, in, I mean, in, directly exposed to the EV in the fund. Thank you, Stephen. Just a quick question, because there's been a couple of people who asked about Bitcoin. Um, obviously, this is a long only equity fund, but maybe do you want to say a couple of words on, on that? Yeah, we and the same same answer to that, that we don't invest in Bitcoin. I mean, firstly, we couldn't. Secondly, Bitcoin would also be considered as quite speculative. So if you if there's such a company that might be uh, that have a business that's related to Bitcoin, let's say a platform, that is deemed to be quite speculative, I mean, from our perspective. But what is quite interesting quite recently is PayPal, you might have seen the news, that PayPal is the first legitimate company approved by regulator in the US that the PayPal wallet could now hold Bitcoin and they can also convert Bitcoin in the wallet to make transactions through the 30 million merchants that PayPal has got. And this is coming in the next three to six months as we speak. So that is very exciting for us. But it's the same story uh, from our perspective that we would expect some of this company, if they're high quality business enough, that they would be able to capture these sort of opportunities for on our behalf. So be, us being an investor in this company, we can get exposed to these sectors indirectly. But if you ask me, would we ever consider investing into a business that is so business is to basically to embrace Bitcoin, to roll out Bitcoin, I think it's very unlikely because that would deem to be quite speculative in its own right. And you can never get high enough conviction on whether this company that you invest into is going to be the ultimate winners because there could be another 50 companies doing the same thing at the same time. Um, currencies and, the, and whether we are managing currency risk within the fund. So the listener has realized that a lot of the companies we mentioned are, are mainly traded in US dollars. Um, and maybe you can explain, uh, especially with the funds, euro and GBP share classes, how this, whether, whether we are doing anything to hedge currency risk. Yep. So in terms of currency, I will, I will give you two pointers on that. The first one is we have the ability to hedge currency if we want to, but we have not done that since we started the fund over the last three years. But we do have the ability to do so if we feel that currency risk is, uh, is more prominent uh, on a fund level. Secondly, if you look at the underlying exposure of the fund, which you don't see on our fact sheet, on our fact sheet, you'll probably see 70% in the US, about 25% or 30% in Europe, etc. But then if you look at the underlying revenue exposure of our companies, we have less than 50% exposure to the US economy. Because a lot of companies that we talked about earlier, they are all global companies. So while they are US listed, uh, but they operate globally. So hence, it's not, it's not a, a simple exercise to say, oh, I have, I have let's say 5% holding in Adobe, it's a US company, why don't I hedge the risk uh, on the US dollar 
uh, with the same 5% because the Adobe is quite a global business that is US would account for, let's say, about 50% of, of Adobe's business, etc. So, so hence the curr currency risk in itself would be taken care of on that level. And the last point I will make on this is if we don't like the dynamic in a country, let's say, let's say if we don't like the companies or we don't like the dynamics that we see in a country, then we, it's likely that we will just avoid that country completely. The reason that we are invested in the US a lot now is firstly because of the companies that we find, they are very high quality businesses. Secondly, in terms of the corporate governance, the dynamics within the country, the US country is quite stable in, in general context. So I think we feel quite comfortable that these companies can continue to deliver the return that we, we set out to do. And if you're interested, yeah, you can speak to maybe me direct or at later in terms of the different share classes that we offer. Thank you, Stephen. There's been a question about interest rates um, and how they impact the selection process of underlying securities, but maybe you can talk about how, maybe reiterate how we, how we take macro into account um, or, or don't in, in the fund. Yep. Uh, I, I, yeah, I didn't have time to expand on that. Typically, I think it's quite important just to give you a taste on how we actually execute the process. So in terms of what we do at Bluewell, everything is bottom up. So we we do a lot of research on companies. We translate our understanding of what's going on in the world on the company level. What we don't do is we don't take a view on what's going to happen on the macro level. So if you ask me which way, I mean, is Trump going to be elected or is it Biden to be elected? How is Brexit going to play out? What sort of interest rate we're going to get? three years from today, we have little idea. But what we try to do is we translate those kind of uncertainty onto the company level when we make forecasts over the next three to five years. So basically, if you ask me, is interest rate going up from, let's say, 1% in the US to 2% in the US 10-year interest rates, is it going to impact the earnings growth trajectory of Adobe, Autodesk, Visa, PayPal, etc.? the answer is no, or very immaterial in terms of the impact, then we would continue to like these companies. But then if we have other companies that we look at, let's say, I mean, we would never invest in a bank, but let's say if we're looking at a bank and the interest rate does have a material impact, depending on which direction the interest rate is going to go, then it's unlikely that we will invest in those businesses because that is deemed to be quite difficult to get conviction of. So we would, we would try to avoid macro uncertainties at all costs, and we like our companies that can transcend those uncertainties. Thank you, Stephen, that was very clear. There, there have been a couple of questions about investing in emerging markets and one in particular on Alibaba. Um, and particularly tech stocks in emerging markets. Maybe you can expand on, on that and our approach. Yes, so the, I think there are a couple of things. Uh, in Asia, we, we haven't got a lot of exposure to Asia on the, on the fund level, but under, I mean, underlying revenue exposure that we do have about 20% of the fund that's exposed to Asia through the company's uh, operation in Asia or in emerging markets. But the reason that we don't have a lot of direct exposure to Asia is because the quality of those companies typically are much lower in Asia compared to the Western world, such as the US. And you probably have seen the news on Alibaba that we do cover the companies. You look at the valuation of Alibaba or Tencent, it's not very attractive to start with. I mean, it's probably a bit more, even more expensive to the US, the counterpart in the US. Secondly, there's a lot of unknown when you go into those opportunities, which, which means that there will be a trade-off for quality. Like I think Alibaba has proven the point that for the end financial, it was yet to be IPO. It got flopped just about 48 hours before. I mean, you would never expect that in the Western world, such as like in the US market, like that's not allowed to, I mean, you, I mean a company would not be doing that sort of things. But in, in, in Asia, that is not, it's probably may, maybe quite easy that you would have this from time to time. So to get conviction on Asian companies is much more difficult. 
and they are just typically deemed as lower quality businesses unless we can invest into those businesses at a more attractive price significantly more attractive than what we can find in the us then we will be interested but not for the time being so so basically the short answer is that obviously there are a lot of opportunities in asia or in emerging markets but they are just not for us for the time being and in time if valuation become more attractive then yeah we will consider them Thank you, Stephen. There's been a question which we can probably have a whole uh, session about, which is our views on, on growth versus value and whether there's going to be a shift from one to the other. But maybe you can give a, a brief um, overview on our thoughts and, and, and how, how, we, how we look at growth versus value. Yes, thank, thank you for the questions. And if you have time, I mean, do come to our website that we have written some articles on this value and growth. Uh, debate and I, I wouldn't have time to just go through every point that we, we have now. The I think the first level that we we look at a company is we want to invest in company that we feel that are attractive value. So attractively value means that it's likely they can do better than the market. And I think that's how we have managed to outperform the market over the last three years. So that is very important. But if you're talking about the typical value and growth debate, which is related very much to low headline PE stocks, a lot of this company being structurally challenged, uh, not doing very well before COVID started, and now is even in a worse shape on the back of COVID. So let's say maybe use airlines as an example. I mean, for us, these companies are just low quality businesses or low quality sectors that we are just, we wouldn't even consider them as part of our investable universe. So, so what it means is, I mean, I think over the last two weeks, you probably have seen that a lot of these lowly rated business or low quality businesses have done quite well, or they have recovered quite a bit. But in order for that trend to be sustainable from here, then you need to have a material change in terms of the improvement in the underlying dynamics of those companies which means that they will continue, they will start making a lot of money now from this point onwards, and the business model remain quite resilient despite all the macro uncertainties that's out there. But to us, we don't feel that anything has changed for this company. If you tell me airlines in, in general, they have never made any money in the past. It's always a very cyclical sectors in general, very, competi very competitive. You always have the pricing, pressure the oil price at the same time etc that has not changed at all so th that might be over maybe let's say over five year time horizon that might be a moment for some of this company to do well but over the medium term typically they ended up not making any money for investors versus other opportunities in the market Thank you, Stephen. I've realized that we've gone slightly over and I, I need to um, uh, give some concluding remarks. There have been a couple of questions regarding performance on the fact on the ICAV fact sheet. Um, we aren't able to show performance yet due to for some regu regulatory reasons. It's not that we don't want to show performance. But please do remember that this is a mirror strategy to the UK OIC. Um, so the performance should be more or less in line, uh, just there'll be some discrepancies on, on some fees. And the fees are slightly different because the, of the fact that the, the fund, the ICAD is slightly smaller. And as we see scale and as we, uh, the fund does grow, the, the, the fees should, should be more in line with the existing product. So that the, the, the reason for that discrepancy is slightly because the fund is slightly smaller. But in terms of the fact sheet, which we send out on a, on a monthly basis and you will be able to find online that we are not showing a performance chart um, at this stage but for regulatory reasons but you if you take that the fact that each each share class was launched at 10 pounds you'll be able to calculate um, how the fund has fared since inception on the 25th of September 2020. Um, with that, I just want to thank all of you for all of your questions. Unfortunately, we, we didn't manage to deal with all of them, but please direct any which haven't been answered to your me direct representative or advisor or come directly to Blue Whale and come and ask our questions at our in, into our info mailbox and our, we'll, we'll look to get back to you. But I'll, I'll take this opportunity to thank um, everyone for joining us this evening and also thank you to Ingrid 
for organizing this event and to me direct for, for, for having us present to you this evening. Stephen. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for all the questions and I really enjoyed speaking to all of you. And I think the only remark that we make is we have done relatively well since we started three years ago. And what we try to do is we look forward over the next three years. So there's a lot of things that we'll be thinking about the research that we are doing now. We'll be looking out for the next three years. So thank you for all the questions that you've asked. And if there's anything else, we will try to keep you informed as well. Thank you. Stephen and Edward, thank you for your time today and for the information provided. I am sure we all found it very interesting. And obviously, we will keep updating our news and article sections with any information provided on, on, on the fund and how it is performing. Also, a big thank you goes to all of you who joined us today. Our team of advisors are available if you have any further questions. Also, um, information on the fund discussed can be found via our website, www.medirect.com.md. Thank you, everyone, once again, and have a nice evening.